I grew up at Brentwood Baptist and was very involved in the student ministry. I began to see how we as believers have an obligation to make the gospel known to those who have never heard it. After college, I moved back home to Nashville. I moved into my apartment complex, and after I moved in, I really tried to be very intentional in meeting people. 90% of my neighbors are either refugees or immigrants, and so they come from cultures that are all over the world, from all different religions and all different worldviews. They're very religious people, and so religion is something that it's a topic that they love to talk about, actually. It's very different than um, the Southern American mindset where religion can kind of be a taboo, but with these cultures, they're very zealous for their religions, and so they love to talk about it. A lot of these women come from cultures where the art of henna is a really big deal, and so one of my favorite things to do, I have a friend from Afghanistan, and she's a beautiful henna artist. I go over there, and we drink tea, and we talk, and. Um, share stories about our upbringings and she'll draw henna on my hands and um, it's just a way to um, kind of cross that cultural bridge and a lot of times I just go into it and I say, hey, I, I just learned a, a story from my holy book, can I tell you? And a lot of times they're like, of course, and it's way more natural to just share a story like it's an important part of my life and then just have conversation and ask them questions. You know, what do you believe? Tell me about your religion. Oh, well, tell me, how do you get to heaven? And so that's a very, very easy uh, place to talk about the assurance of the gospel and how if we're followers of Jesus, we can have total 100% confidence that we will be with him when we die. I think that we just have to reorient our minds and reorient our schedules to make time for people because it's worth it. This exact apartment was picked out by God for me and that he has specifically placed me in this mission field uh, to share the gospel with my neighbors who otherwise might never have heard it. What a great illustration of this very series. So we have to reorient our time, as she said, and our priorities uh, in order uh, to live sent among our neighbors and the nations. Take your Bibles and turn with me uh, to Matthew chapter 10. Uh, we're in week six of our seven-week series uh, coming out of this workbook. Uh, there are still uh, many of these available, several of these available on the tables right outside of the doors. Uh, so if you're a guest, I see several with us on a holiday weekend, you are welcome to these. Also available for free on our website. So these are Bible studies that go with these messages that we've been preaching. And they go on for the full 13 weeks. Uh, so for many of you over the summer looking for something to study, uh, looking for something to do with your small group, uh, this would be a great tool uh, to continue on uh, through this journey. And so we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 10, which is really kind of a continuation of Matthew chapter 9, at the end of that passage that we looked at uh, just a few weeks prior. And so one of the realities of my life is that I was very shaped, just as you are, by many of the experiences that you have growing up with church. And so I was raised in First Baptist Church of Salem, Illinois, but uh, as I was growing up, I was like many of you, I don't know how many of you were raised in church, but I heard the sermons, countless sermons. We had mo church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, so you usually got at least two, sometimes three. Uh, we had kind of all of the traditional programming, so I had been there and done that. Uh, and so by the time you get to be a teenager, let's just be honest, you have a little bit of an attitude when you're a church kid, like, impress me, right? Uh, so you just have kind of seen it all, done it all. I know those stories. I've heard that before. For. But that all changed when I got a phone call as a 19-year-old young man from a little church called Wise Town Baptist. I want to put up a picture of it for you. Looks like many little churches that we see scattered throughout the landscape. If you're me, I'm always curious, right? All these little churches that are out there, what they're like, the, the people that are there. Well, this was the church that I had a connection to. Uh, it was the church that my grandparents were members of, the church in which my mother was raised. As a, fact, as a matter of fact, my mother was married. Uh, my mother and father were married in this building uh, 46 years ago this weekend. Uh, it's Wise Town Baptist Church in Beaver Creek, Illinois. Beaver Creek is right behind the church, and here's the reason why we always remember there's a creek there, because in the getaway car, my dad's cousins put about 100 frogs that they had caught in the creek during the ceremony. And so as they drove away, my mom is screaming, and my dad is throwing out frogs as quick as he can as they drive down the road uh, trying to find them all. So uh, that has become one of our family legends, uh, and so this place has a rich history for me. 
But when I was 19, the pastor of this church called and said, hey, we've got a few junior high boys in this little farming community. There were about 60, 70 farmers and their families who attended this church on a typical Sunday morning. We've got about a handful of junior high boys, and we know that we don't have young people coming through this community very often. Would you be willing to be our youth minister? We'll pay you a whopping $100 a week, right? And I was like, wow, that's a lot of money, you know? And so this next slide will show you and the pictures of some of these young men. Uh, yes, as my daughters noted, as we were looking at these pictures yesterday, they were all boys. Uh, they scared off all the girls, I guess, that were in the community. Uh, there just weren't very many, but they were all boys. And so we would roller skate. We would play basketball, as you see. If you can look really closely on that center picture, it's one of my favorites. Uh, there's a Nerf football about to hit a kid in the face. As I took this picture, now that's the kind of kids that these were, right? So we're going to take a picture quick, you know, hit him with a football. They were rambunctious. They were junior high boys. But all of a sudden, this 19-year-old who thought, he knew it all, who had been raised in the church, I all of a sudden had a totally new challenge, right? These guys challenged me in every way. I had to learn behavior and classroom management techniques, right, to keep us on track because you never knew what kind of sounds or Let's be honest, smells would occur uh, when I was in the middle of teaching Bible study. So I had to keep them on track with all of that. But probably one of the most challenging things for me was that these stories and truths that I had heard all of my life, I now had to study and learn, and I had to translate into seventh grade boy language, right? And that was one of the greatest moments for me of learning and stretching as a follower of a Jesus Christ was to have to learn God's word, understand the principles here, and be able to teach it to a group of junior high boys. My faith began to deepen in a whole new way as I tried to connect the gospel to the lives of these kids, many of whom had never been out of the county in which they were born, I discovered, as we began to, to take different trips and do different activities together. What a moment it was for me. And looking back, it was such a faith-building and challenging time for me at the same time. As you know, many of you have heard the stories before, I almost quit. Uh, I had such a challenging time with some of these kids. They got sideways with each other. I broke up fights. I had the tires slashed on my 1985 Monte Carlo by a kid who was mad with me. And I went and I wrote in my journal in my dorm room, God, I'm a failure at ministry. If I can't handle a handful of junior high boys, what will I ever do for you? And do you know what the Holy Spirit whispered in my ear in that moment? You won't ever do anything for me. It will always be about what I do in and through you. And so from very early on in ministry, I learned important lessons. A pastor and deacons there who were very supportive of me. And so it was amazing what happens when all of a sudden you're thrust out of your comfort zone. And that's exactly what happens to the disciples in Matthew chapter 10. The passage that we're going to read today. Jesus had been teaching them in Matthew's gospel, of course. We have the Sermon on the Mount in those first few chapters. Amazing teaching that they were exposed to. But now Jesus gives them a new challenge. He sends them out into the towns and villages on what we might call the world's first short-term mission trip to experience the challenges and the stretching of their faith in a way that they had never experienced it before. Will you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read from Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 16 this morning. So Jesus sent out these 12 after giving them instructions. Don't take the road leading to other nations, and don't enter any Samaritan town. Instead, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, announce this, the kingdom of heaven has come near. So heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, drive out demons. You have, been, you have received free of charge, give free of charge. Don't take along gold, silver, or copper for your money belts. Don't take a traveling bag for the road or an extra shirt, sandals, or a walking stick, for the worker is worthy of his food. When you enter any town or village, find out who is worthy and stay there until you leave. Greet a household when you enter it. And if the household is worthy, let your peace be on it. But if it is unworthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that house or town. I assure you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah 
than for that town. Look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and as harmless as doves. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, what a mission. What a mission to be entrusted with sharing the good news that the kingdom of God has come near in the person of Jesus. Oh, Father, I thank you that as we begin to think about the going in our gospel, how you've compelled us to go, that you did not leave us without instructions. And so, God, I pray today that by the power of your spirit, the principles that Jesus gave us will be clear to us so that as we go, we will stay in step with him and with your spirit. Father, thank you. Thank you for the calling on all of our lives to participate in your great mission, the greatest purpose the world has ever known, to make Jesus known to all peoples, to our neighbors and our nations. So God, open our hearts and our minds and our lives to you in this place today, and it's in the matchless name of Jesus we pray these things, and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated this morning. So looking back in your Bibles there at the last few verses at the end of chapter 9, again, this is kind of part B, uh, uh, to be continued sermon. I want us to be reminded of what Jesus saw, right? We see there the great need that was in that region uh, during that time, the great need that Jesus saw in the lives of people. It says in chapter 9, verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion, a word that means he kicked in the guts, right? He, he felt it in his gut for them because they were what? Weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. Now, I know there's lots of people weary and worn out. You know why? Because I feel like half our church is on vacation this week, all right? It's like, man, so, school is out and boom, all right? The first wave has already hit the beach and the theme parks, and you guys have your plans, I'm sure, to get there as well. Why? Because we're ready to escape, because we're weary and worn out people. Things haven't changed so much in 2,000 years. The pace, all of the things we distract ourselves with, they might have changed. But the pace of our lives is such that we will always work ourselves into a place where we are weary and worn out. Not only that, Jesus says the people were spiritually malnourished. They were like sheep without a shepherd. As we talked about a couple of weeks ago, sheep, directionless, defenseless, Jesus saw that there was a huge spiritual need. And so what are the instructions that he gave to his disciples? Was it strategy? No. Instead, he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out, a word that means thrust out, okay, workers into his harvest. And here's what I find so fascinating about that prayer is as the disciples are like, okay, Jesus, we're praying. And I told you this a couple of weeks ago. There are some of you who think that prayer is, quote, you know, you're getting off the hook, right? Oh, good. All we have to do is pray. No, prayer is the battle. Prayer changes not God's mind, but it changes us and our hearts. It draws us into line with his plan and his purposes and his will because Jesus knew exactly what he was going to ask of these disciples next. And so in essence, Jesus knew that they were going to be the answer to their very own prayers. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. Summoning his 12 disciples, that's a military term in the Greek, as a commander summons his troops. Now Jesus summons those who have been praying to the Lord of the harvest for workers. And guess what? He tells them, you're going to be some of those workers. He gave them authority. Remember in the Great Commission, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus from the Father. And so Jesus now delegates that authority to his disciples. Then we get a listing of the disciples. And I know for you and I, that seems pretty common. Okay, here's a list of the 12. Only happens three times in the Gospels. There's a reason why. We're going to circle back to this in a little bit. But note the fact that this is one of the times that we understand exactly who was sent. Matthew's original audience knew these men. He knew that, as it says in Acts chapter 4, they were, quote, unschooled and ordinary guys, right? 
And so there's a reason that we have this list. There's even a reason that there's a little note on Matthew's name, right? Who happened to be a tax collector, a traitor, someone considered religiously unpure and unclean by his own people. Translation, if God could use this band of guys, then he could use anyone. And so now we begin to see, as we begin to look at verse 5 on, uh, the, the, the goal of the mission of Jesus that he set out. And we ask some very important questions that apply to us and our living scent today as well. Question number one, to whom do we go? Question number one, to whom do we go? Well, Jesus gives them specific instructions. Don't take the road leading to other nations and don't enter any Samaritan town. Instead, go, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, a couple of things there, because we're like, wait, isn't Jesus for all people? He certainly is. But in this case, in this moment, Jesus focuses his disciples on a specific mission. And he will focus you as well for a season and a time on a specific mission. In essence, what Jesus is calling his disciples to do is to go share the gospel in the towns and the villages that they were accustomed to, the Jewish towns and villages. So in one sense, this is practical advice. Start where you're at. Go to the people that you're already connected to. This is where you begin the mission. There were other factors, of course. The Samaritans were the enemies of the Jews. And so I don't want you to get distracted yet, all right, with going to the Samaritans. I don't want you to get, stra- to get, uh, to get distracted wandering down the paths that go to the other nations just yet. Instead, I want you to start where you are ministering to the people that you're conversant with, the people who understand the word pictures and the illustrations that I have taught you that you are going to use. But again, very important to understand. Let's zoom out for a second. It's Matthew's gospel that gives us the great commission, right? That tells us to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. So even if God calls us to a specific people group or a specific place for a specific time, that doesn't mean that he's going to not call us on later. So begin where you are is what Jesus, is how Jesus instructs his disciples. But don't stop there. Where do you begin? You need to start where you're at. We're all called to live sin. As we go, we make disciples of all nations. And for some of us, as we just saw in the video, God is bringing the nations to our doorstep. And so there are opportunities all around us as we are continually living sin, being disciples who make disciples. So start where you're at. Number two, what do we say? So what is our message that we declare? Well, what was the message that Jesus gave them? The kingdom of heaven is near. In essence, this is a message of hope. You see, when people have this tendency to believe in God, they believe that there's something out there, the vast majority of them, but they don't know how to get to him. And they're confused by all of the religions and all of the different things that they hear. Especially in this era in history, there was this view that, especially among the Jewish people, that you know, God was so high and he was so otherworldly, they didn't even say the name Yahweh when they read the text out of reverence. All of those things were good, but they had taken it to such an extreme that they did not think that they could get to God. Instead, Jesus totally reverses that and says, preach a message of good news, announcing that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, it's the way that Matthew puts it, is near, that he's come near to you, not just in ideas or philosophies, but he's come near to you in a person, the person of Jesus Christ. Number three, so what do we take with us on this mission, right? I just talked about packing for summer vacation. I have four children. When we get ready to go, my kids want to take our entire house with us, all right? Any others out there who pack the van feel my pain, right? So it's like, no, you don't need to take all of your stuffed animals, right? Every piece of uh, clothing in your wardrobe, every pair of shoes, every gadget and device. We're going to get away from that stuff, right? When we go on vacation. But somehow my kids want to take it all with us. Jesus wants his disciples to simplify the mission for a couple of reasons. Number one, so that they won't be distracted, right? Don't take anything with you that's not necessary. But there's a second reason here as well. 
It's because they need to learn how God provides. They've got to learn this. We've got to learn this. We have a dangerous tendency towards self-sufficiency. And so therefore, we want to have all these caveats and all of these things to fall back on. And what, in essence, as Jesus is sending out his disciples, one of the lessons that they needed to learn was how God provided in unexpected ways, in ways that they did not plan or prepare for. That there were going to be people who would open up their homes. That there were going to be people who would provide their meals for them. And not only that, this was a way that God was at work in the lives of those people who were providing those things as well, that word worthy in the text can be a little confusing because in essence it means people who were receptive and open to the gospel. Our missionaries call those people or persons of peace that oftentimes God will place in communities that are unreached. People who might not yet be followers of Jesus, but they're receptive and open to the gospel. And so they help provide hospitality. Sometimes they help provide protection. When I lived and served in inner city Baltimore and we were all living in a row house, there was an African-American man who was next door who was not a follower of Jesus Christ, but he looked out for us. Watched the house when we were gone. Talked to the neighbors around to say, hey, these kids are all right. They're here to help kids in our community this summer. God works in these kind of ways, and this is one of the realities that we have to grapple with. One of the best parts of our international mission journeys and those projects is not only the going and the serving and the gospel sharing, but it's the seat that I get to have to watch how God provides for so many of you who go. Because I can't tell you how many times a year I hear the conversation, wow, I, I really feel the Lord leading me to go serve in Guatemala or Nepal with one of our short-term teams, but I, mean, I just don't know where the money is going to come from, right? And I just encourage people, I was like, you pray, and God will provide. And countless times... The, the testimonies that come back are remarkable. As people see how God provides, uh, it's through their grit sometimes, through their serving and, and writing letters and asking people to pray and support their trip. Sometimes it's God's grace uh, in the way that he provides unexpected resources for them to be able to go. I tell our own story of our adoption of an international child that as we were on the forefront of that journey, we were like, all right, Lord, we're in. And then we got the documentation, stacks of it, that talked about everything that we would have to pay along the way. And when I began to add all of that up, I remember sitting at our kitchen table being totally overwhelmed. As a guy, you feel responsible for being the provider of your family, and there was no way on a youth minister's salary that we were going to be able to raise this amount of money out of our family budget. It just wasn't possible, and I wept. I did. Fast forward about three and a half years later, we're sitting in a hotel room at the Yak and Yeti Hotel in Kathmandu, Nepal. And I log in, right? It was almost like dial-up internet, you know, over there. But I log into our bank account and there is more money in our bank account than at any point in our marriage because only God can provide in that way. He provided the resources that we needed to bring our son home. And you see, that's the way that God works. And he wanted his disciples to understand those truths. That if God has called you to it, as the old preacher saying goes, he will see you through it. And so the disciples go. And what are the results going to be? Because that's the other thing that we want to know ahead of time, right? We'd like some assurance that there's going to be some payoff, that this is going to be worth it at the end. Jesus says, expect mixed results, right? Some people will respond, but others you're going to have to shake the dust off your feet and you're going to have to move on. Jesus would teach his disciples the parable of the sower. And you don't know when you go, if you're planting a seed, you don't know if that seed is going to be plucked away. You don't know if it's going to fall on hard and rocky soil. But here is the responsibility of every disciple of Jesus to make him known and to trust God for the results. Our job is to be faithful and obedient. The results... Well, they may vary in a lot of different ways, but the result for us is that we are called to be faithful and obedient. And I want to put up a picture of a learning pyramid for you for just a moment, because I think this is one of the things that was so brilliant about what Jesus was doing and why this is so important for us. I know if you're in the back, you can't read the fine print, but I want to tell you what this is. The National Training Laboratories in Maine did a research that just verified uh, what good teachers have known uh, throughout the ages. They're at the very top. If you just listen to a lecture, you're going to retain about 5% 
of what you learn. If you also read alongside of that lecture, you're going to retain about 10%. If we put up some audio visuals for you, like this, okay? I do this often in my messages because, let's be honest, we're all trained to look at screens, and all of a sudden when I put something on the screen, you guys lock back in with me for a minute. You're going to remember about 20% of what you see. If I demonstrate something to you, a few weeks ago, Andy Beal used a helium balloon and a, a balloon that he had blown up, right? That stuck with me for several weeks. I still remember it. About 30%, we're going to remember that. If you'll notice on the left, there's a dotted line. Those are all what we would call passive teaching methods. But now we move into participatory teaching methods. If you're in a discussion group, life group, focus study, and you engage in that discussion, you're going to retain about 50% of what you learn. If you do, if you practice it by doing, you're going to remember 75% of it. And if you have to teach it to others, you're going to retain 90% of what you have learned. You see, I thought I knew the Bible when I was a kid growing up in church. But when I had to translate it into seventh grade boy, <laughs> all right, I learned it in a whole new way. And the same is true for you. And as Jesus sends us out, he knows that this is the way he's wired us, right? He's our creator. He knows that when we go, again, not living for an identity, but from our identity in the gospel, that we are going to grasp our faith in a whole new depth and in a whole new way. So let me put up three takeaways for us this morning. Three realities that we need to be aware of that this passage teaches us. Number one, we don't have to be, quote, great to reach the least, right? We don't have to be great to reach the least, but we have to be obedient. I love the way that Oswald Chambers puts it. He states it so eloquently. He says, God can achieve his purpose either through the absence of human power and resources or the abandonment of reliance upon them. You see, Jesus thrust them out to where they would be challenged, to where they would have to rely on him and on him alone. He goes on to say, all throughout history, God has chosen and used, quote, nobodies because their unusual dependence upon him has made possible the unique display of his power and grace. I don't know about you, but that's what I want to be. I want to be a unique display of his power and grace, right? As the old saying goes, because I'm nobody telling somebody's about the one who can save us. That's the, what, the reality that I want to mark my life. And when you think about these disciples, you think about their background, the reality is, is they were a bunch of fishermen, they were a bunch of tradesmen. Again, most of them had not passed the muster to get into rabbinical school, any of these kind of things. These are not the kind of guys you would have put on your team. I ran across an example years ago of a mock letter drafted by the, quote, Jordan Management Consultants Group. Uh, giving Jesus a letter of recommendation after evaluating the 12. It says this, It is the staff opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background, education, and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you are undertaking. They do not have the team concept. We would recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience and managerial ability and proven capability. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas, he demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel that it's our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Business Bureau. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, definitely have radical leanings, and they both registered a high sc score on the manic depressive scale. One of the candidates, however, shows great potential. He's a man of ability and resourcefulness. He meets people well, has a keen business mind, and contacts in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your right-hand man. All of the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new venture. You get it? The list of disciples is there for a reason. It was so Matthew's audience would know that all of us, in the authority and in the power of Jesus, given, delegated to us, are called to go. But we have to be obedient. 
Takeaway number two for us today is this. Gospel goers, it should be depend, sorry about that, on gospel givers. Gospel goers depend on gospel givers. The mission depends on both. And there are some of you who are going to be called to go. And we're going to launch you out of here to start new churches, to plant new campuses, to reach new people, to go to new cities, to go to the foreign mission field. There are going to be some of you who are called out of here for those purposes. But you need us who will pray, who will give, who will support, who will write, who will encourage you. In some seasons of your life, you may be one or the other. You may be in a season of your life in which God is compelling you to go. And you need to know that God has given people the ability and the opportunity, as Jesus teaches us in this passage, to help provide for those needs. So don't let that hinder you from going. Because there are people called to be gospel givers. What's interesting is, is often after people go, they come back. And then they have a season of being gospel givers themselves to support others in going. But both are critical to the mission of the gospel. And we can't let ourselves off the hook in either way. Gospel giving, gospel going. They both go hand in hand. And Jesus teaches us here that both are crucial to the mission. Takeaway number three for us this morning is this. That our character, our character, no matter where we go and as we go, must commend Christ. You'll notice that when we stand up, I read verse 16. I haven't talked about that one yet. Let's look at that one for a few moments this morning before we go. In verse 16, Jesus says, look, look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Now we talked about sheep a couple of weeks ago, right? So this doesn't exactly thrill our hearts because we know sheep They're directionless, they're defenseless, right? Well, our shepherd has given us a direction, but if we're sheep, that means we're defenseless. Back to the earlier point, that means we are totally relying on the resources of God to provide for our needs, to protect us, to give us everything that we need. But if the world sees a sheep thriving among wolves, it will certainly get their attention. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. As a matter of fact, Jesus is honest with us that it's not later on in this chapter if you continue to read and study it, and I hope that you will this week. Jesus says, just remember, the world's going to hate you. It hated me first. So know what you're up against. Be prepared for this reality. I'm afraid that in the church today, we've done a great job equipping sheep to go out among sheep. But how does it change your disciple making? How does it change your Bible study? How does it change the way that you equip your children and your grandchildren in your home when you realize I am equipping sheep to go out among wolves? All of a sudden, it just got interesting. (laughs) Things just got serious. And that's the challenge that's before us. But this is by God's plan and God's design. So we know that Jesus goes with us. And look at what he says in the very next verse, the very next uh, phrase. Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and as harmless as doves. Well, that's an interesting statement. I remember reading that as a kid being like, wait a minute, serpents, snakes, we don't like them, right? Because Satan in, in the garden, the serpent thing, we just want to stay away from all of that naturally. But snakes here, the word for shrewd also means wise. And it's interesting that if you study the animal kingdom, you will discover that snakes are given by God the unique ability to survive in all kinds of conditions. It's why you will find snakes, right, in the desert and in places where nothing else can live or in which nothing else wants to live. The doves, what are doves single-minded about? Feeding themselves, basically, right? Doves doves have a singular focus. They want to eat. That's why Noah sent a dove out of the ark, because he knew if there was anything out there, he was going to find it, and he was going to bring it back. Both the snake and the dove pointing out the reality that we are to be single-minded. Yes, we are sheep among wolves, but we are following. We are single-minded in our pursuit of the good shepherd. I love what one commentary said. We are to be godly, but not gullible. Snake smart, but not snake sneaky. That's the way that Jesus sends us out into the world. And so as we go, we go not only with the commission, but also with the principles and the truths we need to be reminded 
of the reality that Jesus has entrusted his mission to us. And so therefore, we are to start where we're at, but we're not called to stop there. We're called to bring a message of hope and an announcement that the good news is here. And so to make people grapple with the implications of the gospel, that's what we're called to do. We're called to live simply and allow God to provide, to rely on his resources so that only he can get the credit. And we're to go with a singular focus. As sheep who know that we're going among wolves, but who know that we have a good shepherd who loves us, who guides us, and who leads us forward no matter the cost. Will you bow your heads with me this morning as we come to this time of response and commitment? I love the practical nature of these teachings. I love that our Lord and Savior loved us so much that he not only commissioned us, but he gave us a manual, so to speak, on how to go about the mission so that all of the glory would point back to him. So a couple of things this morning. One, of course, if you don't know Jesus, you can't share in the mission. And so if today, as we've been preaching and talking and unpacking this, you realize that there's a void, there's something missing in your life, you're not compelled to do any of these things we've talked about because you don't have a relationship with the living God to compel you. And the Bible says today is the day of salvation, and we invite you to find what you've been looking for. Maybe today that message, the kingdom of heaven is near, is the message that you need to hear. To know that Jesus is near. That God in the flesh has come to you. That by his grace you can be saved through faith. And out of the overflow of that, you will want to go tell others of the good news that you found. Maybe today you've been with us in this series praying, been reading your emails, been praying with and for you so, so encouraged and yet so challenged by the opportunities that God has placed in front of us. So maybe today you need to be encouraged and strengthened to be reminded that in the Great Commission, Jesus said, I am with you always. To be reminded that he is with you as you go as you face these kind of challenges, as you feel like you're a sheep among wolves in your neighborhood, in your own family, in your workplace, in your school. The good news is that Jesus goes with you. He's commissioned you and he's with you each step of the way. Oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Matthew chapter 10. I thank you that Jesus knew that his disciples had to get out there and participate in the mission to grow as disciples. I thank you that you entrust the same to us and that we grow when we are simply obedient and faithful. So God, would you make us your sheep among wolves? Would you make us your servants and your missionaries and your ministers to a lost and broken world that desperately needs to know a Lord and Savior? And it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said... Amen. Will you stand with us as we sing this theme song for this series and as Andrew leads us?